Hello, my name is Katie. Welcome to my channel. This is going to be a bit of a long one because I've found a document that has hit a nerve, let's say. Now, I can't go live on my YouTube channel because you need 50 subscribers. So please go ahead, share this um, channel. I would appreciate it because then I can go live and we can discuss the documents that I find rather than me just telling you about the documents that I find but this one trigger warning we're going to be talking about forced and coerced sterilization of persons in Canada this is a report from July 2022 from the standing senate committee on human rights um, so a bit of a summary, sterilisation is a surgical procedure to prevent conception. Forced or coerced sterilisation occurs sorry, when sterilisation is performed without the patient's free, prior and informed consent. Canada has a long history of forced and coerced sterilisation. For much of the 20th century, laws and government policies explicitly sought to reduce births in First Nations, Metis and Inuit communities, black communities and among people with intersecting vulnerabilities relating to poverty, race and disability. Those the, sorry, though these explicit eugenic laws and policies have been repealed, the racist and discriminatory attitudes that gave rise to them are still present in Canadian society and forced and coerced sterilisation still occurs. Keep in mind that this report was published in July 2022 and they are saying that forced and coerced sterilisation still occurs. Beginning in 2019, the committee undertook a study on the extent and scope of the forced and coerced sterilisation they heard from experts and civil society groups. In 2022 they heard additional testimony from, including from several survivors. The practice of forced and coerced sterilisation is not confined to the distant past and law and policy changes are needed to prevent this horrific practice from being inflicted on others. The report highlights the experiences and perspectives of survivors and outlines the solutions that the committee believes are needed to bring an end to this unacceptable practice. I, I can't believe this is a thing. It's so alien to me and I hope to whatever God is out there, if there is one, that it stops. Forced and coerced sterilisation is horrific and ongoing in Canada. It is contrary to Canadian and international law and it must end. In 2015, media reports of forced and coerced sterilisation prompted the Saskatoon Regional Health Authority to commission a review, which was completed in 2017, and included calls to action relating to support and reparations, cultural training and education, and law and policy reform. Bit of historical context, there's a long history of forced and sterilised forced and coerced sorry, sterilization in Canada, including as a strategy to subjugate and eliminate First Nations, Metis and Inuit peoples. The National Inquiry into Missing and Murdered Indigenous Women and Girls highlighted that official policies of sterilization emerged in the 1920s as part of the eugenics movement and formed part of a genocidal policy against indigenous peoples. And that report, if you're interested, is called Reclaiming Power and Place, the final report of the National Inquiry into Missing and Murdered Indigenous Women and Girls. Dr Evan Adams, Deputy Chief Medical Officer of Public Health Indigenous Services Canada, stated that, quote, for Indigenous women in particular, for, <clears throat> sorry, forced and coerced sterilisation is an act of sexism, racism and cultural genocide rooted in colonisation and paternalism, end quote. There are historical documents that show approximately 
1,150 sterilisations of women from the north of Canada and women being treated in federally operated Indian hospitals. And that is according to Dr. Karen Stout, Assistant Professor, Women and Gender Studies Programme at Wilfrid Laurier University. In an inquiry that was done in the 1970s, it was determined that hundreds of Indigenous women from 52 northern communities were sterilised. Through her research, Dr Karen Stout, sorry, apologies, Dr Karen Stout, a professor at Wilfrid Laurier University, was able to determine through looking at the historical records that at least 70 women were sterilised. In Igluic, 26% of women between the age of 30 and 50 were sterilised. In Nuijat, formerly known as Repulse Bay, almost 50% in the 30 to 50 age group were sterilised. In Joa Haven, 31% of women had been sterilised. More than 25% of women in Chesterfield, Inlet and Kugaruk had been sterilised. Those are the only ones that were well documented, but there's, there's probably more. Other data from the Minister of National Health and Welfare indicates that at least 470 Inuit and Aboriginal women were sterilised in 1972 alone. In addition, it would be remiss if we didn't acknowledge that some men were also given vasectomies and sterilised without their knowledge or consent. The committee heard that other vulnerable, group, vulnerable groups have also been disproportionately subject, subjected to the procedures, including black and racialised women, persons with disabilities, intersex children and institutionalised persons. For example, in a submission to the committee, the Canadian Association of Community Living and People First of Canada observed that until the 1970s, Alberta and British Columbia legislated the sterilisation of persons with intellectual disabilities without their consent, particularly targeting those living in institutions and those with racial, sexual, cultural or socio-economic differences that were deemed to be deviant or unfit. In sharing their stories with the committee, witnesses who identified as survivors of forced and coerced sterilisation spoke of the significant impact the procedure has had on their physical and mental health, their relationships, their families and their communities. The following provides graphic descriptions of forced and coerced sterilisations. Its contents could be disturbing or upsetting. All the survivors who testified before the committee described scenarios in which their sterilisations lacked free, prior and informed consent. These included medical staff seeking consent for the procedure at inappropriate times, threatening patients, misinforming patients about the necessity or the effects of sterilisation and in some cases not requesting consent at all. On the 11th of September 2001, Nicole Rabbit was scheduled to undergo a caesarean delivery at the Royal University Hospital in Saskatoon, Saskatchewan. Apologies for all the mispronunciations. Nicole was administered an epidural for the procedure and her hands were restrained to her sides. She, she recounted that the delivery was normal and they welcomed their baby daughter, Ali. Their, her happiness was replaced with concern when, while she remained immobilised, her newborn baby was taken away and the doctors and nurses left the room. And this is a quote from Nicole herself. Some nurses and doctors returned, she could hear them talking. Her partner, who was sitting on her left-hand side by her head, told her that the delivery team were huddled at her feet. A nurse then approached her on her right-hand side and said really loud that she couldn't hold another baby and it was best that they tie her tubes. She was confused and she looked towards her partner. The nurse then turned to her partner and said 
she can't hold another child. It's in her best interest to have this procedure done. Her partner reiterated what the nurse had said, so she asked if it was reversible. The nurse said yes. She had no time to think and she couldn't think clearly. The nurse informed her that she needed to decide. She was coerced into deciding, still being fully exposed, her abdomen still open from the C-section, her arms still tied down and numb. She felt pressured to say yes. Moments later, she could smell something burning and she thought, did they just burn my tubes? Then the doctor proceeded to close her up. She trusted the medical team but knew something wasn't right when she smelt the burning flesh. They were, these people were strangers who she had no previous encounters with who insisted that she tie her tubes. The medical team took advantage of her in a vulnerable state. No one asked her what she wanted. No one explained why she needed this done and she didn't sign any forms and she still has no real idea what the options were and why they said it was best for them to sterilise her. And she knows now that the sterilisation can't be reversed. I am not maternal. I, I do not have children. I do not want children. Children scare me. And this is hard hitting for me. So another survivor who wished to remain anonymous shared the story of the birth of her son in 2018 when she was 24 years old. She described both her vulnerability and confusion when doctors raised the possibility of tying her tubes while she waited for cesarean delivery for her distressed baby and risked going into septic shock. She explained that given her state of mind at the time, she was willing to provide consent for the sterilisation if it meant the cesarean section would proceed and her baby would be saved. She felt that the life of her unborn child was in her hands and that if she didn't sign the documents fast enough. After she agreed, she remembers the doctor and the nurse entering the room. They asked her partner to leave the room and he left. The witness's mother stayed in the room, however. The doctors and nurses started asking me if this is what I really wanted and how I could change my mind because she might regret it. They also said she couldn't change her mind if she happened to find a new partner and wanted a child with them. She was completely caught off guard and she felt like they were trying to safeguard themselves by making her fight for her tubes being tied. At that moment I felt like I had to prove myself to them and prove how serious and committed I was to my partner. Another witness... Sylvia Tuckernell informed the committee that shortly after she'd gave, given birth, medical staff waited for her husband to leave her bedside before forcibly moving her to an operating room, administering another epidural and sterilising her, all while she protested and cried uncontrollably. Sylvia stated that she was sterilised against her will when she was 29, on July the 9th, 2001, she went to the Royal University Hospital in Saskatoon in Labour. She gave birth to a healthy baby boy and she states that she's absolutely sure that she never signed anything. As soon as her, left, as soon as her husband left the hospital, she was taken into an elevator in a wheelchair to another room. Uh, someone came up behind her and wheeled her into this room. She told this person that she didn't want to do this, but he didn't listen. She didn't know what she was objecting to at the time, but she just had a terrible feeling and no one had talked to her about what was going on. She was taken into that room to be prepared for another epidural. She still had one in her back from the birth. While she was in this room, she kept saying, no, I don't want to do this. She was crying uncontrollably. No one listened and she was ignored by everyone in that room. She felt so vulnerable because her legs weren't working properly because of the first epidural. She was put in a bed. She kept crying. She was terrified. She was hyperventilating and they tied her down to the bed. She could smell something burning. No, no one was talking to her. No one was telling her what was going on. And then when it was all done, the doctor said, there, tied, cut and burned. Nothing will get through that. 
After all that, she was just relieved to get out of the room. She was taken back to the maternity ward and it was only then that she got to hold her son. Another survivor, Louise Delisle, recounted to the committee that while giving birth at the age of 15, her mother was barred from the delivery room. She explained that the doctor delivering her daughter took it upon himself to perform a partial hysterectomy, something she would only discover years later when attempting to bear children with her husband. Louise told the committee that she was very young when she had a daughter, she was 15. She had to leave school because she began to show that she was pregnant. It was actually her principal that told her parents that she was with child. She says, quote, of course, my daughter was taken away because I was so young and I was the eldest of seven children living in a very poor home, end quote. Just the fact that she said, of course, my daughter was taken away. Why is it taken for granted that your daughter is taken away because of your age? Anyway, um, she says she remembers the birth and it being absolutely horrific. She had a nursing assistant with her. And she remembers the nurse saying, you can't do that. You need permission to do that. And a doctor saying, too late. I don't want to see this girl back here again, having kid after kid and going through this and maybe worse. We won't be in this position again. That was what the doctor said. Nothing was discussed with her or her mother. Her mother was not allowed in the room with her when she was giving birth. And she had to go home without her daughter because at the age of 15, she had to give her away because she couldn't provide for her. She never, she didn't know what the doctor did to her. So when she was 29 years old, she, she married and they wanted to have children. So they were trying for children, but they ended up going to a fertility clinic. And that was when they found out that she'd had a partial hysterectomy. What, 14, 15 years later? Another survivor, Malika Pop, was equally misinformed that her sterilisation would be reversible. She spoke of being interrogated, shamed and subjected to systematic racial profiling and harassment by medical staff prior to and during her caesarean delivery. Miss Pop also noted the absence of appropriate steps to ensure that free, prior and informed consent had been obtained, explaining that in her case, as in the case of many others, consent was sought in a time of severe pain while in the throes of labour. Another victim, Elizabeth Esquiga, informed the committee that as a childbearing teenager, she was coerced into having an abortion, during which she was also sterilised, recounting that a child protection worker told her they would take the baby one way or another. She characterised the pressure from the social worker and doctor as immense. She was kept uninformed about the sterilisation procedure. Quote, I can't think of where I had an opportunity to speak with an actual counsellor or social worker about the long-term effects of what I was going into. It wasn't offered. All I recall is a small room with a doctor in a white coat and social worker standing in the corner and both of them taking their shot at me, so to speak, end quote. Another survivor, Lucy Nickerson, said she encountered similar manipulative treatment. She explained that she went into hospital for a minor medical procedure when she was 29 or 30, and her doctor suggested, while we're in there, we might as well give you a hysterectomy. It was never explained what was going to happen, and when she came out after the operation, she did not feel good. She kept asking them to let her go home, but they wouldn't. Another survivor, Morningstar Mechlady, was sterilised without her consent at the age of 14. She told the committee she'd been unable to talk about her sterilisation until she was in her 50s. Can you imagine? Like, I don't blame her. Uh, these women that are coming forward now, the amount of bravery it takes to come forward and talk about this. So Morningstar said that what happened to her when she was 14 and pregnant, she can't really, she can't bring herself to discuss. And it's not just that one-off incident. 
it's not like the women leave and get over it. it. The report found that a lot of women avoid healthcare services because of these procedures that they had done. And then, of course, it spreads through the community like wildfire. If you know someone in your community went to hospital to get help and then they were sterilised against their will, some of them screaming, no, don't do this to me, you're not going to go to hospital to get help. That is putting themselves at risk, understandably. I wouldn't want to go if I knew what had happened to my friend. It's putting women off getting help, and men. Whilst I haven't found any quotes from men in this report, it does say that men were being sterilised as well, against their will. A lot of, the, a lot of these people have post-traumatic stress disorder. They also have suicidal depression. Some of these people, it might be that it might have been their life wish to have children and that was taken away from them for no good reason. A lot of these women feel shame and guilt and fear. And a lot of women, it says, they may have had children before the sterilisation they didn't want to take their kids to the doctor in case the doctors took the children away from them. A lot of people distrust doctors. They wouldn't want to take their children to the doctors just in case they took their children away from them. For the smallest of reasons, they would take their children away. That is what they thought because that's what they had seen in their communities. Miss McCready highlighted that the foundation of who they are is based on a matriarchal society. And that community is everything. Miss Pop, one of the survivors, said that the, the coerced sterilisation erases indigenous line, lineages. She explained that where the violated have Indian status, such as myself, the repercussions reflect an inability to pass that status onto future generations and decreases the number of people. For these reasons, several survivors and expert witnesses describe this practice as amounting to genocide. Miss McCready states that she believes that, quote, we will never adequ adequately be able to determine the number of women, men, girls and boys that were sterilised in residential schools and in Indian hospitals. I say that to acknowledge the fact that this has been going on for as long as those institutes of genocide have been in place in Canada and is currently going on now in 2022. We will never be able to adequately determine the number of women that are being tortured and subjected to forced, coerced sterilisation. The committee has come up with various recommendations for Canada to actually implement such as ensuring that all allegations of forced or coerced sterilisation are impartially investigated and the persons responsible are held accountable and that adequate redress is provided to the victims. Also to adopt legislative and policy measures to prevent and criminalise the forced or coerced sterilisation of women, particularly by clearly defining the requirement for free, prior and informed consent with regard to sterilisation and also by raising awareness among indigenous women and medical personnel of that requirement. I mean it should be illegal anyway to sterilise someone against their will but yeah and also allowing people to know their rights is so important. You must give informed and prior consent to something medical. Canada provided follow-up information in response to the UN Committee Against Torture's observations and recommendations. Canada's response noted that forced or coerced sterilisation is a crime in Canada, constituting an offence under one or more sections of the Criminal Code. In addition, all provinces and territories have legislation requiring consent for medical care and treatment. Canada's response further noted that the federal government, through the Royal Canadian Mounted Police, is committed to investigating reported allegations and 
treating those who report such cr- such crimes in a respectful manner. Despite the existence of these offences, Elisa Lombard noted that there have been no reports of doctors facing consequences for acts of forced or coerced sterilisation. Miss Lombard and several other witnesses advocated for the inclusion of a special offence in the criminal code relating to forced and coerced sterilisation. In addition to criminal offences, healthcare practitioners can face disciplinary measures from their professional governing or licensing body. Apparently, each province and territory has laid out through statute its own framework for oversight of healthcare professionals by self-regulating bodies. These bodies are responsible in turn for setting standards of practice, credentialing providers for reviewing and responding to complaints made against healthcare professionals under their authority, for education and for disciplinary action when warranted. Where is that disciplinary action? Sorry, sorry, sorry. In 2019, Indigenous Services Canada established an advisory committee on Indigenous women's well-being, which provides ongoing gender and distinctions-based advice to Indigenous Services Canada on issues relating to the social determinants of health with a particular focus on sexual and reproductive health includes representatives from several Indigenous organisations, as well as the Society of Obstetricians and Gynaecologists of Canada. Based on its recommendations, Budget 2021 provided $33.3 million Canadian dollars to expand support for Indigenous midwif- midwifery and doula initiatives in Canada. The federal government has also provided funding to Indigenous women's organisations for the development of information products on reproductive rights. In January 2020, the ISC, the Indigenous Services Canada, worked with the National Collaborating Centre for Indigenous Health to facilitate a forum on culturally informed choice and consent in Indigenous women's health. So far, there have been no reports of doctors facing consequences. There have been none, according to Ms Lombard. However, the risk of criminal sanctions could have an impact. At least we know that it would be better than what we have at the moment, which is nothing at all. If doctors know that they could potentially be subject to criminal sanctions, this could change behaviour quite quickly. Why do the doctors not know that it is unethical, it is immoral, it is inhuman? It is all the bad words. Why do they not know this anyway? Isn't it part of the doctor's, like, pledge to not cause harm, to help people? Sorry, I am getting off off script. Just, I get so annoyed. How can these doctors not have a moral code built into them. Right, okay, back to the report. According to Virginia Lomax, Legal Counsel, Native Women's Association of Canada, murder is a crime and that has not solved the problem of missing and murdered Indigenous women in Canada. It is clear that this is a much larger systematic issue. Criminalisation will only be a small piece of the puzzle. Every moving part of the system that creates these injustices must be informed in a way that will prevent, not simply react. I mean, the girl got a point. Dr Adams noted, this is Dr Evan Adams, Deputy Chief Medical Officer of Public Health Indigenous Services Canada, noted that the need to ensure that there be repercussions for violence, racism, and sexism in the healthcare system, but this approach need not be punitive. So the first recommendation is that legislation be introduced to add a specific offence to the criminal code prohibiting forced and coerced sterilisation. Why is it not already criminalised? Is it because the reproductive rights of women don't matter? Sorry, again, I am going off piste. Recommendation two that the Government of Canada work with provincial and territorial governments in adopting a non-adversarial dual jurisdiction approach. They need to study 
publish a report on and include in training the clinical, psychological and physical impacts of sterilisation generally and forced and coerced sterilisation specifically. They need to mandate medical associations and professional governing and licensing bodies to denounce forced and coerced sterilisation and provide a clear consent framework consistent with governing legal principles. They need to ensure that all healthcare practitioners are required to undergo intensive training in the physician slash patient fiduciary relationship, bodily autonomy and medical self-determination and mandate that health practitioners are required to pass such training as a condition of their licence. When discussing compensation, obviously nothing was, is going to make up for this loss. But some of these people have tried fertility treatments because they thought that that would help. They did not know that they were sterilised. The direct costs associated with attempting to reverse some of the harms of unwanted sterilisation can be significant. A 28-year-old survivor who wanted to remain anonymous stated that she and her partner are trying to save between 10 and 15,000 Canadian dollars for a procedure that could enable her to have a child. She stated that vitro fertilisation and those kinds of things are expensive, but she wants to be able to experience them eventually. 10 to 15,000 dollars to fix something that should not have happened. Miss Lombard described these direct costs in greater detail. Any technology designed to reverse the procedure, you know, the, the forced sterilisation, could cost at least $5,000 and hold little to no chance of success based on some medical understanding. Reproductive technologies cost upward of $50,000 and the losses they experience while not being able to try some of these alternative methods cost them unknown quantities of human dignity on a daily basis. Dr. Malhotra explained that the trauma of a single instance of forced or coerced sterilisation can ripple through families and communities, and this needs to be taken into account when developing a framework for compensation. Miss Omenio, apologies, said, quote, There is no real compensation, but at least there should be an acknowledgement of the trauma they have experienced as a result of forced sterilisation. I don't necessarily say that it has to be money, but at some point there should be some engagement or acknowledgement of what has happened to these women and how it has affected and changed their lives. End quote. Another recommendation from the report is that the Government of Canada, led by survivors, should develop a compensation framework that reflects both the direct and indirect harms that forced and coerced sterilisation has inflicted. Another recommendation is that the Government of Canada issue a formal apology on behalf of all Canadians to all persons who have been subjected and forced and coerced. I've said that incorrectly. Basically, they want them to apologise, which they should have done anyway. For consent to be valid, it must be voluntary and the patient must have the capacity to understand what is being conveyed. According to the report, forced and coerced sterilisation is clearly continuing in Canada. Susie Basile, Professor and Canada Research Chair in Indigenous Women Issues Holder in Quebec, expressed concern that Quebec does not recognise the concept of cultural safety as part of its public health policy. Just a little fascinating fact there. Sorry, I'm getting really salty on this one. In testimony to the committee, Dr Evan Adams spoke about his experiences during medical school and residency. You may be able to hear my cat, I apologise. Where he encountered paternalistic and racist approaches to clinical care for women, including being asked by obstetricians many times, what are you going to do about indigenous birth rates and teen pregnancies? Is Surely he's going to help these people give birth and care for their children. That is what I would hope would happen. Sorry. Another recommendation is that the Government of Canada encourage 
governments, both provincial and territorial, to implement measures to ensure that professional standards of governing and licensing bodies are adhered to, that mechanisms are in place to investigate and respond to complaints, and that consent policies and practices adequately protect all patients, particularly in moments of vulnerability. They've also suggested that the Government of Canada take steps to support the implementation of various things in nursing schools and medical schools that require students to take courses dealing with Indigenous health issues, including skills-based training in intercultural competency, conflict resolution, human rights and anti-racism. Another recommendation is that health Canada work with applicable partners to launch a public education campaign about patients' rights and consent procedures and that the campaign be tailored to the specific needs of Indigenous, Black, racialized, remote and marginalised communities as well as, those, as well as those of people with disabilities. There's a section about getting more people from different communities into the medical profession. Because it is true, if you see someone who looks like you, you are going to assume that they understand where you're coming from. And that is a comfort. So yeah, there should be more people of colour in the medical field. That doesn't just imply to Canada, apply to Canada. Could do with that over here as well. Another recommendation is that Canada invest in its community-based midwifery, especially in the northern and remote communities. Another recommendation is that they should collect and publish data on forced and coerced sterilisation to help authorities fully understand the scale of the issue and to develop responses to it. And they recommend that the Parliament remain apprised of Canadian and international development relating to the issue of forced and coerced sterilisation and that a parliamentary committee conduct further study as needed on the issue of forced and coerced sterilisation, including to monitor government efforts to address the issue and to develop further recommendations. There's a whole list of recommendations. We've heard some witness testimony that is truly heartbreaking like I almost cried and I'm on medication to make sure I don't cry this is horrific that this is still happening I was aware that indigenous women are going missing in Canada I knew that was an issue but I did not know that forced sterilization was an issue I hope that this is continued to be looked at I would hope to see reports on how this has improved, if at all. I know it's still quite soon. This was published in 2022. I would like a discussion in the comments, a kind, mindful, compassionate discussion. I would like to hear from people in those communities that have been affected or that know someone that has been affected. What can we do to spread awareness? What can we do to help these people? If there's any more information out there that I've missed, please send me the links. If you have listened to the whole of this podcast, I appreciate you. Thank you. This one was a long one, but I felt that it was important. This is genocide. There's no ifs or buts about it. The report says that. It's just horrific. I hope that the people who have gone through this torture can find happiness in life that they can that they still have hope that they still have hope in humanity that's my wish i hope that the survivors of this torture are happy i hope the survivors of this torture are coming to terms with what has happened to them i hope that they are living in spite of what has happened to them I hope the survivors know that they are seen and that we, as the world, want something done to stop this happening. If you've made it all the way to the end of the podcast, thank you. Appreciate it. I took up a lot of your time. Please share, like, comment, subscribe. This is an important topic that I thought I would cover. I'm going to do these deep dives 
now and again. So if something that you like the sound of, please subscribe to my podcast on either Spotify or YouTube. I am going to stop talking. So thank you for listening. Please spread the awareness. I will leave the report in the show notes description. Thank you for listening. I look forward to the conversation below. And thank you for helping spread awareness that this is still happening. Thank you for listening. I'll talk to you in the next one. I'll better sign off. Goodbye.